As you know, the tradition of this conference is for each partner organization to give essentially a report card from their organizations. So I would like to ask my colleagues to start to share the events from the past year with their institutions. First of all, if I could introduce Eric Tuckman, who I know is familiar to many of you, and Eric will be giving the ICDR update today on behalf of India Johnson, who's not available. Uh, Eric, as you know, is the General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of the American Arbitration and has been involved with numerous initiatives, both in arbitration and mediation. So Eric, what's happened at ICDR this year? <laughs> Uh, I'm also looking for, I want to make sure our, our PowerPoint is, is on its way. Uh, so in the last year, am I on as well? Okay, thank you. Uh, the last year uh, for the ICDR in particular has been a year where we've been spending quite a bit of time focusing on particular industries, particular fields, uh, where uh, there has been, in our mind, uh, quite a bit of opportunity uh, for additional use of the process. Um, uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so in particular, uh, in Washington, D.C., here just a few months ago, uh, we hosted an aerospace program uh, that's an area where we've seen some consistent growth in terms of caseload, and also in our interactions with uh, those in that field, a desire and opportunity for uh, arbitration and mediation to be used more effectively. Uh, construction, obviously, is an area where arbitration is uh, presumed, uh, welcomed, uh, adopted in significant respects. But in terms of the ICDR's uh, work, we again, uh, in our actions with those in the field, uh, saw uh, much more synergies uh, with our, our domestic um, AAA colleagues uh, and parties to those cases as well. Uh, technology has been a particular focus for us. I'll sp speak in a minute about our own internal desire to come up to speed with respect to cybersecurity and security generally. Uh, but technology disputes, it's no surprise, is an area where uh, there is considerable growth and opportunity. Uh, so we've been working much more closely, working with attorneys, parties, and others uh, who haven't traditionally used arbitration to resolve the disputes. Um, we've seen uh, some significant resistance, perhaps with intellectual property disputes in particular uh, in the past and uh, concern about things like finality um, and uh, preference for other forums. So again, the point is the world's a big place uh, and we have been focusing much more in the past year and we plan to do in the future years as well, uh, focus on these particular areas where we know and think that there is um, significant need and demand for uh, arbitration and mediation. An exciting uh, development for us, and actually there are other institutions who have these plans as well, of course, is to expand, uh, expand in Asia. Uh, we are currently in Singapore. Uh, there is a new building, Maxwell Chambers Suites, that's being built out. Um, as with Maxwell Chambers, uh, it's beautifully done, designed, uh, should be completed in the first quarter or half of next year. And the association will also expand its, uh, its presence in Singapore uh, with new space and additional staff. Uh, we currently have a vice president in Singapore. We are administering cases out of that office. Uh, and with the additional staff there, uh, we plan to expand our capabilities both with respect to our presence in Asia physically, being able to be in more places, uh, and also expand our case management capabilities there. Uh, the staff that will be there will, of course, be trained and capable uh, and knowledgeable about the process, uh, and we look forward to expanding our ability uh, to uh, uh, offer those services in that part of the world. Something we're also considering is being able to offer support um, 
essentially the idea is 24 hours. So we have a case management center in New York. Uh, not all of our parties are from New York uh, and with an office in another part of the world, uh, there would be the ability to provide uh, support to cases um, at all hours of the day. A lot of logistics to figure out with something like that uh, and access to information and the like, uh, but uh, that's something we are working on. Uh, we'll also have additional seminars, programs, um, uh, themes, organized around themes. We feel as though there's a lot of research to be done uh, that's of interest to ADR users, arbitration practitioners, lawyers, and parties with respect to the use of uh, arbitration mediation uh, in Asia, and we plan to um, uh, work in that area as well. From our perspective, uh, in terms of just where we stand in that part of the world over the past five years, uh, there are over 5,000 parties in uh, ICDR cases that have come from that region. Uh, the total claim amounts for in those cases have, has been uh, almost six and a half billion dollars. The claim amounts, on average, um, over six million. And uh, within Asia, the top filing uh, parties come from India, Japan, China, Korea, and interestingly, Australia. The industries that are filing from that part of the world, energy, technology, franchise, and construction. Uh, internally within the association, uh, I should say the ICDR, something we rolled out this year is our International uh, Administrative Review Council. This is something we've talked about before, but the ARC, as we call it internally, uh, has been a way to organize issues that come before it uh, that involves uh, request to remove arbitrators. Uh, sometimes, um, uh, I think a common theme among institutions is that uh, there's frequently objections about whether a case is subject to arbitration, where there is, in fact, a, an agreement to arbitrate. The institution's role, of course, is not to make those determinations, but to make a general determination about whether the filing requirements have met. Is there a prima facie case to proceed with this arbitration? That's not a terribly high uh, threshold, but it is, there is a threshold there nonetheless. Uh, and at that stage, parties can be very, very uh, dug into their positions uh, and sometimes taking aim at the institution itself, the ICDR, uh, to the extent they, they may or may not want us to proceed with the administration of a case. So this is an organized body of ICDR executives. Uh, it's also uh, an additional member is the former general counsel uh, of the AAA, Marissa Peterson and uh, who, who is uh, free of conflicts, fortunately. Um, uh, she does not really have an arbitration practice, but she's quite an expert in the field. So this committee provides uh, consistency, um, a higher level of attention to detail, I think, and it also provides us to centralize where these decisions are being made, how they're being made, and to effectively carry out uh, the policies that exist with respect to these areas. We also hope that the, uh, the, the council can produce additional statistics. Uh, a major initiative of the ICDR in, and the AAA generally has, to been, has been to improve our data, both internally so that we can report it out. It's always been a concern of ours when we are reporting on, on, on caseloads or aspect of caseloads uh, that the information we contain might have been collected in a way that perhaps is inconsistent from center to center, or from div division to division, or individual. We standardized a lot of that. Uh, and now we think in the year or years ahead, we will be able to be much more uh, forthcoming with, with uh, data information. And uh, the council being centralized will also allow us to produce illustrative examples of how we decide issues regarding arbitrator removal, uh, how we decide issues regarding whether something as similar as the filing requirements are met. Uh, so that's been quite successful. Uh, an update on emergency arbitrations. P uh, again, a very frequent area of inquiry. There have been 93 emergency arbitrations administered uh, since that rule was first incorporated into the ICDR rules. Um, 71 of those matters proceed under the international rules. These are all ICDR cases. Uh, 20 under the commercial rules, which have a similar provision. And actually, there were two on the, uh, our Canadian rules. Uh, the applicant actually prevails uh, in 42 of, uh, 42 of these cases. They lost in 20, uh, and a number settled out relatively frequently during the process. 
but uh, that process, of course, does seem to be very, very popular uh, and increasingly so. There's a steady stream of emergency arbitration fines that are coming in. Uh, something that we are also very proud to talk about is the AAA ICDR Foundation. Um, the, the AAA and ICDR for many years would be frustrated by uh, organizations coming to us and seeking support or funding for ADR-related initiatives, study, research, perhaps community-based uh, dispute resolution processes, um, uh, studies on much larger international arbitration issues. Uh, but the, uh, the AAA and ICDR in and of themselves, uh, it, it didn't quite fit within our framework. So a foundation was created uh, to be able to fund some of these very important initiatives. Uh, I'm very happy an assessment is here. She has been singularly the biggest driver of the success of the foundation. It is a, um, it is a busy organization for how long it's been in existence. Uh, it's given away over a million dollars already since uh, in just a few years. We're entering into our fourth uh, funding cycle and over 100 proposals have been received. Uh, the, the, this is a slide covering um, just some of the international related issues that have been uh, supported by the foundation. Uh, George Berman, I, I believe, is here. I saw him earlier. Uh, he is doing some research on twilight issues in arbitration. Uh, arbitral women um, uh, addressing unconscious bias in international arbitration has also received funding as well and a number of other very interesting and important initiatives. I said just a word about security. Uh, this is not the stuff of uh, black letter law. This is all operations. But all of us internally are becoming increasingly aware and conversant in issues regarding cybersecurity. The things that are unique about arbitration and cybersecurity is that you've got the collaboration of arbitrators, institutions, law firms, all working on different platforms, but exchanging information that's sometimes highly confidential uh, across these different platforms, and increasing sophistication among those who want to seek it out. Uh, there's a huge variation in the knowledge and training and understanding, sophistication regarding these issues. And then everybody, as I say, is coming to the process using different platforms and technology. Uh, and a lot of people don't know where they really stand on these issues. So um, uh, uh, the, the note at the bottom here about the myth of hack sophistication is that, look, you know, there are so many out there so much better than me in understanding this. And if they can't get on top of it, I'm not going to be able to either. But we're, we are very much uh, working against that, that, uh, that myth. So in the past year, we've established, uh, it was actually the two years ago, uh, an internal security committee uh, that is quite focused on these uh, issues. Uh, I'm happy there's a number of ICDR staff here. They will tell you about the phishing tests that go out uh, where you know, it looks like a, you know, a, a, an email from somebody reputable, an organization they know, but they're trained to know how to see, uh, identify the fakes um, and not to click on the links, not to forward them, et cetera. Uh, we engage in third-party vendors to do this. We engage in third-party vendors to call up staff pretending to be parties and asking information about cases just to make sure that people are, are giving the right answers. So very important, a lot more to come there, and I think an initiative for the future as well. If we could skip on to the next slide. Um, uh, a quick word about our designation as the uh, arbitral institution uh, that was, is handing the Annex 1 binding arbitration program. Uh, the, the Privacy Shield program uh, is a, a compliance mechanism for data protection requirements. Uh, involving the transfer of data from the EU to uh, Switzerland and the US. Uh, and there are 4,900 companies that are participating in this program. Uh, it's, it's been quite substantial, and we are happy to be part of that as well. Uh, this topic deserves more than a quick overview, considering how much it's been in the news, and frankly, uh, to some extent, misrepresented. Uh, but I do want to emphasize how committed the association is to diversity 
uh, the percentage of roster members added to our roster in the past years uh, is reflected here. And as you can see, um, this is a sustained effort. It's important. Every executive at the AAA uh, it has incorporated into their annual goals and to in the performance reviews issues regarding diversity. Uh, so we've been very committed to this in the past. We've made a lot of success, and we will continue to do so in the future. And I'm going to conclude my comments there. Thank you very much. National Court commenced his second term as of July of 2018. So, Alexis, to you. Good morning, uh, everyone. F first of all, thank you, Meg. I'd like, first of all, to thank you and all the exit team for organizing this conference and to emphasize our support, continuing support to this event, which is, I think, a unique forum of discussion and exchange between our three organizations. It's very important that it moves forward every year, and you can count on us to, to support it moving forward. So I'll, in 10 minutes, uh, try to report as quickly as possible on some of the highlights of uh, this 2018 as the uh, year ends. There are many, uh, but uh, in the limited time that is uh, allotted to me, I will only focus on some of the developments. Uh, 2018 has been a robust year for the ICC. I think that we will close the year in a couple of weeks from now, <clears throat> significantly on top of the 810 new cases that we had received in 2017. We also expect to see a confirmation of the high average value in dispute in our cases. Uh, average value in dispute in ICC cases has been in 2017, <clears throat> close to 140 million US dollars per case, and I can say that this year will be uh, in an amount which is uh, very close uh, to that. So that is, I think, an indication that the ICC uh, continues to attract the highest value, more complex multi-party, multi-contract dispute. Another trend <clears throat> that we see this year, and it confirms that we have seen in the past is the high proportion of cases involving a state or a state entity. About 20% of our caseload, uh, we have a caseload currently of 1,600 pending cases, more or less. About 20% of these cases <coughs> sorry, involve a state or a state uh, entity. Uh, in terms of treaty-based arbitrations, which is, of course, uh, relevant to this audience, uh, we have so far administered 55 cases uh, in total. I'm not talking about investor investment protection cases at large, because many are based on contract, but cases that are based on treaty. Uh, 40 of these cases were administered on the, under the ICC rules, and 15 by the ICC as a pointing uh, authority. We have received four uh, BIT-based cases in 2017, and so far two uh, this year. In terms of institutional uh, development, I should first of all mention uh, the very positive initial experience of our uh, expedited rules. The expedited rules, as you know, have been introduced uh, in the <coughs> ICC rules of arbitration that enter into force on the 1st of March of 2017. Uh, and as you may recall, uh, these expedited rules, which is a fast track procedure, apply on an opt-out basis, provided that two conditions are met. The first is that the amount in dispute is lower than two million US dollars, and the second is that the arbitration, the underlying arbitration agreement, <coughs> post dates the 1st of March of 2017, which is the date of entry into force of the rules. And why is that? Because, of course, the new expedited rules are not, do not apply retroactively. They apply to new cases only. So we have not yet seen uh, the full flow of cases coming in on an opt-out basis. You should uh, consider that about 40% of our caseload, as I said, about 1,600 cases, 
involve amount in disputes of less than $2 million. US dollars. Uh, so we will see a large, large number of cases coming in, uh, in uh, starting in 2019, I think. But the interesting thing is that we have seen this year a very large number of requests for opt-in, for the expedited rules to, to apply on an opt-in basis. We have received 111 of these requests, uh, 25 of which have resulted into an agreement to apply <clears throat> the expedited rules on an opt-in basis, that is to say to cases where uh, either the arbitration agreement post-dated uh, uh, predated, sorry, the 1st of March of 2017, or the amount of dispute was higher than 2 million US dollars. Uh, 15 expedited rules cases reached the, reached the stage of uh, an award, and it is very encouraging to say, to see that uh, in all of these instances, the award was made timely, that is to say, within six months after the case management conference. In one instance, there was a, an application a request for an extension of time, of one week, so very limited. So the experience shows that the system works. Uh, when we discussed and approved the expedited rules, uh, there were some concerns expressed uh, within uh, the commission of the ICC uh, uh, that uh, it would not be feasible to uh, make awards uh, in six months without uh, breaching uh, due process rights or without generating complaints for the parties. This is not what we see based on this first experience. What we see is that those cases are very ably managed and proactively managed by arbitrators, having uh, the necessary availability. And of course, the secretary of the ICC uh, is very attent to verify the availab availability of these arbitrators. So the experience, the return of experience so far is very positive. We will now see in the couple of years to come uh, whether that is confirmed when we, have, when we will have hundreds of cases administered under the system. Uh, I'm confident that it will. If it is, we will consider uh, whether increasing the threshold, the $2 million threshold, is appropriate or not. Uh, another development of 2018 has been the first year of experience of our new case management team in Sao Paulo, Brazil which is very positive. We have had uh, this year 31 uh, new cases uh, registered in Sao Paulo involving 102 parties <coughs> for a total amount of dispute of uh, about 7 billion uh, reales. 10 out of these 31 cases involve state entities. And we also have opened in Sao Paulo <coughs> with the help of ICC Brazil, a hearing center, which I have to say is a state-of-the-art uh, facility uh, open to uh, not only to parties uh, to ICC arbitration seated in Brazil, uh, but also uh, to uh, uh, arbitration conducted under uh, other rules. Uh, Singapore, uh, this year, of course, is the year of our opening uh, in Singapore. It, uh, Singapore is our fourth uh, case management team uh, out of Paris after Hong Kong, which was opened in 2008. Uh, uh, then we had Hong Kong, Sao Paulo, as I just said, and Singapore. And the team in Singapore is currently administering 62 cases, which is a very good level after about uh, six months uh, of activities, and it is uh, growing uh, rapidly. And finally, in terms of uh, the global foot footprint of the ICC, I should mention <coughs> two important initiatives that we have taken this year. The first has been the creation of the ICC, ICC Court Africa uh, Commission uh, in July of this year. Uh, the commission is presided by one of our vice presidents, uh, Ms. Danga Kamau from Kenya. Uh, it has representation from Benin, Cameroon, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Mali, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, and Togo. And I <coughs> place great hopes in this group to uh, uh, develop not only the footprint of the ICC, but also uh, 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 the uh, uh, culture of arbitration and, uh, uh, and the arbitration community in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, I believe, the continent where we will see uh, the uh, most part of the growth in our activities uh, in the years to come. Uh, another uh, original uh, initiative that we took is the creation of the Belt and Road Initiative Commission uh, of the Court. And I think this is something that we discussed already, and I would welcome uh, cooperation between, uh, between the, the BRI Commission and EXED. 
because, of course, the importance of the BRI initiative, of course, no, time, no time to dwell into that, but the importance of this initiative cannot be uh, overstated, not only for the global economy, but for arbitration. Uh, in particular, uh, the BRI ICC Commission is chaired by Justin D'Agostino, uh, who is, uh, as you know, the head of uh, uh, the Herbert Smith arbitration practice in, in Hong Kong. It has 13 members and has appointed so far 19 ambassadors from 11 uh, jurisdictions, and we are looking forward in particular to organizing uh, cross-regional events uh, between this commission and our groups in Africa and Latin America, which are regions where, of course, Chinese investments are extremely relevant. And to conclude, of course, I need to mention uh, 2018 development, the fact that 2018 uh, has seen the election by the ICC World Council of the uh, new ICC Court of Arbitration. I'm in this regard very proud that we have managed to have a court with complete gender parity, uh, 176 members with 86, 88 uh, um, women, 88 uh, men. Uh, we have, of course, gender parity as well in the Bureau, which is the body uh, uh, um, uh, including all of our vice presidents. But the fact that we've been able, I think it is a first in the history of the ICC, but also in the history of arbitration, to have such a wide body with complete gender parity is a tremendous development. Uh, the court is also interesting in the sense that we have a very good rate of renewal. We have imposed a rule which uh, did not exist in the past in the ICC that no court member uh, can sit uh, for more than two consecutive terms uh, in the court. Uh, we have now 50% of our court members being first-time appointees uh, with uh, an excellent uh, generational renewal. 50% of our members are of less than 50 years of age, 15% of less than 40 years of age, and we also have a great, uh, great uh, regional uh, diversity. Of course, we, and on, on this I conclude, we need to translate this into more diversity in our, in our population of arbitrators. Uh, the numbers there are still not uh, as good as they should be. Uh, we have less than 20% of our total population of 1,600, about 1,600 arbitrators confirmed or appointed by the court every year. Uh, less than 20% of them are women, which is not good. We still have a majority of these individuals coming, originating from North America or Western Europe, and that is not good as well, and we are planning to develop our efforts to make sure that we appoint more young practitioners and more arbitrators from uh, emerging jurisdiction. So this is all from me. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my turn to update you on ICSID. And the trend that I can point out is that the trend continues. We have seen in the last 15 years an increase in cases, and once again this year, ICSID registered a new record number of cases, 57 new investment cases in the year. So by the end of June, we had registered a total of 676 cases under the convention and the additional facility. That obviously reverberates through the system, and so, for example, we had more than 170 hearings over the year, Interestingly, over half of them by video or audio means, which obviously is an important new trend for cost and time saving. We had 46 cases concluded with 25 awards, but 454 decisions and orders. So a lot is going on and continues to go on. In terms of state parties, there remained a significant diversity and really fairly even distribution around the world, as you can see. So we know sometimes in investment, people have this perception that one region is always getting more than their fair share of arbitration cases. In fact, the statistics show that these cases are very well distributed throughout the world. We have still seen a high number of cases from Eastern European case, uh, states and from Central Asia, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa. We have seen some reduction in South American cases, and also, interestingly, some reduction in Western European cases, whereas the last few years we saw a lot of Western European cases, most of them, of course, coming out of the Energy Charter Treaty. Now, energy and uh, economic sectors related to energy and mining, of course, remain the primary sources of these cases, but again, there is a huge variety in terms of the relevant sectors that feed investor-state dispute settlement. 
By and large, investor state dispute settlement continues to be treaty based. And if you add the bilateral investment treaty cases, which is about 60% of the caseload, with the FTA investment chapters, you will get to approximately 75% of the caseload. We've seen obviously increasing prominence of the Energy Charter Treaty. And we've seen increasingly investment contracts, which last year were 14% of the caseload. And I think certainly an interesting question is as states look at all these investor state issues, are we going to see more use of this direct investor to state contract as opposed to reliance on bits, or are we going to see the same kind of mix that we've seen historically? And I think that will be very interesting. Like my colleagues, we obviously are also very concerned about diversity and taking affirmative steps to ensure that we have a diverse arbitrator pool. For us, this involves a couple of aspects. Number one is nationalities, that there is a good broad sweep of arbitrators from all different regions. And when we talk to our member states, they underline again and again how important this is to the credibility of the overall system. Secondly, of course, is women. And those numbers, as Alexis said, are going up, and that is good. They could be better, but we see them getting better every year. So that is an encouraging aspect. The other issue that we look to at ICSID is what we call um, euphemistically, the first-time flyers. And the first-time flyers are basically first-time appointees. And of course, we all know if you are going to replenish the pool of arbitrators, every single most experienced arbitrator had their first case at one point in their history. And so we are very much looking and trying to find opportunities for arbitrators who are ready to take on this role but need their first appointment. And last year we saw 45 of these first-time appointees, about 17%. So that is also a very, very hopeful number. Um, we acted as appointing authority 91 times, almost invariably appointing presiding or chairs. And we have also made a huge effort to replenish our pool of arbitrators and conciliators. So the chair, the chairman of the Administrative Council, gave, uh, appointed a new roster, and that as well has a broad range across the world, as well as 50% male and 50% female. But more than that, I have been relentlessly bugging my member states to appoint people where their appointments have been expired or have never been made. And so we are seeing a huge, huge uh, increase in that. Last year alone, 102 new designations by states. So that's key. On the institutional side, I think the biggest news and very happy news for me as a former NAFTA person is that Mexico joined the ICSID Convention. So I think that's really wonderful. Um, I know NAFTA is now what some people are calling USMACA, uh, but we got the three NAFTA countries as ICSID members just under the wire. And I think that is a wonderful thing and we were really thrilled to have Mexico join this year. We're now at 154 member states and increasingly we are also reaching out with our other organizations to have facilities cooperation agreements. And this year did an agreement with British Virgin Islands, with the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration and just last week in Morocco with the Casablanca International Mediation and Arbitration Center. So that's a little bit of the happenings at ICSID. The number one happening at ICSID and responsible for a lot of gray hair here has been the ICSID rules amendment process. And I'd like to close just by taking a few minutes to tell you about that process. Uh, you know about the swirl in the environment about what do we do with investor state arbitration. And there are those who say things are just fine, don't do anything, and those who say throw out the system, and a lot of variations in between. And we felt that it was time as an organization that does more than 70% of these cases to take a look at the rules and to see if we could make concrete incremental proposals that help to address some of the concerns brought up in this reform agenda. So we propose a set of uh, amendments to our ICSID rules. What originally was meant to be sort of surgical is now being called the comprehensive set of amendments, and it is. 
Every single set of ICSID rules has amendments proposed to it, and we have added a new set of standalone mediation rules for investment disputes. This was all published in a working paper that was released August 3rd of this year, and we have spent the last few months basically consulting, presenting, doing videos, and talking to anybody who would listen about the kinds of proposals that are out there. And we feel it is extremely important, and I'll take this opportunity today to say it again, to have very balanced input to this, because balanced input is going to result to balanced output. So we have had tremendous uh, consultations with our states, but also a tremendous number of consultations with individual law firms and arbitrators and we are getting terrific amount of feedback on the new rules and what they should look like. We will have our written feedback from everybody December 28th, and if you would like to submit any feedback, we would highly encourage it before December 28th. And then in the next sort of three months after that, we'll fine tune existing proposals, go back to our states, and in what I will fully admit is an optimistic schedule, but one we're pretty wed to, we are hoping to have a full package for our membership that could be passed in October of 2019. In terms of the topics, these are balanced rules. The reality is we need two-thirds of our membership to approve convention amendments and 50% to approve additional facility amendments. And so we set out what we thought was progressive and a step forward, but balanced and something that a core mass of states would be happy with. And there are a number of rules in particular that have garnered the most uh, interest, I would say, which have been, of course, the topic of transparency, non-disputing party participation, disclosure of third party funding, reducing the time and cost of investor state dispute settlement, and that is an issue, obviously, in all arbitration. We've introduced a new optional expedited arbitration process, a process for orders of security for costs, and much more emphasis on alternate dispute resolution and giving parties flexibility in terms of using conciliation, mediation, fact-finding, either independently of or alongside traditional arbitration. So that's the basic direction of our new rules. And I would be most delighted today to chat with anyone who's got ideas. But if not, please feel free to submit your ideas. And I truly hope next year I will be standing here saying we've done it. So I thank you very much for being here today and look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you.